<laughs> but I want to thank you because we are here to talk about your photography. You're with Hidden Exposure Photography. And I am curious, how yeah. did you get started with photography? Like you said you work from home. And I know that the photography is, as for a lot of us Black women, is a slice, bit of a side hustle. Yes. How did you, how did you first come to start taking photogra- photos? Ooh. So if you talk to, um, if you were to have talked to my mom, she would say that I had a camera in my hand from the time I was five. Um, I was fascinated with photos and whatnot. And I wish I could remember which photo it was, but there's a photo that I took of her when I was like six and it's, it's in focus. She's like in the proper position. So it was just sort of something that was always in the background uh, from Polaroids to uh, cameras that took 120 film uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) to those disc cameras that we used to have. I'm dating myself here. I had something like that with pretty much everything that I had. Um, Wanted to do photography classes in high school and college, but you were expected to buy a film camera. And back then those things were very expensive. So there was a period of time where I just documented things whenever I could, you know, I had a little point and shoot, you know, again, more things. And then uh, in 2005, yes, in 2005, I went on a missions trip with uh, the church that I was with to China. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, that November, I went to a pawn shop and I was just looking for something to cheer myself up. So I bought uh, two film cameras, a Canon and a Yashica that I just used for, um, decoration purposes it's a wonderful camera but uh (laughs) it's not it's not operational and um I had this Canon Rebel and it came with the kit lens and I would use it during worship services when I was working with the kids just to photograph what they were doing so I was in essence just teaching myself how to use that film camera and then we went to China and we were there for 10 days and I think I shot through a roll of film a day while I was there so I think I shot through 10 rolls of film and it became an extension of my arm. So for me, it became a way to document my surroundings. It became a way to capture those times in my kids' lives. I say my kids, the kids in the youth group. Um, And I was never too far from it. And I kind of got even more encouragement from another friend a couple of years later um, who really saw gifting in me and just shoved a camera in my hands at that point. And I see the camera as an extension of being able to tell a story. So for me, um, all of my sessions sometimes have a storytelling element to it, uh, be it boudoir, family, uh, just regular portraiture, um, even headshots sometimes. There's a story element to it. I I like to be able to capture um, folks in their natural habitat and to show off their distinct and unique beauties. So that's kind of how I got started and where my ethos is with photography. Okay, and what I've noticed, and one of the reasons I wanted to feature you is that, um, and this is true of a lot of the photographers I'm interviewing right now, is that you tend to um, feature people who might not normally be featured mainstream, right? When we're talking about a certain type, um, Mm -hmm. blender, thin, or what people like to call fit even though mm, fit can't be determined by physical look we know that we've got some pretty sick with them people some pretty healthy people so so you do feature like atypical bodies atypical Mm -hmm. look and what drew you to doing that because a lot of photographers regardless of how they look they want their fit their pictures to look like not everybody else's but they tend even if it's like a unique posing style or editing style the models quote unquote the clients quote unquote they all kind of look like for lack of a better way to put it mm-hmm. what inspired you to kind of drift away from that so <laughs> you you brought up two really good things. So I want to address how I started with it and um, my why. And uh, I may go on a little tirade there for a second because it's on oh. my passion. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, how it started is that it, it started from my own story. I am tall, fat, 
just as an aside, I use fat as a descriptor. Uh, there is no negative or positive connotation to it. I, I consider fatness and body size to be the same as handedness. So I'm left-handed, I'm fat, I'm tall, I'm black, and I'm a woman. My sister did one. When you say you're tall, how tall are you? 5'11". No way. Yeah, it doesn't look like it because I'm proportioned, but yeah, I'm almost six feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Tall women. So cool. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people, that's a whole nother conversation. A lot of my guy friends were like, you're lying. And then I would stand up next to them and we're like this, you know. And let me guess, they're Tom Cruise is 5'9". Yeah, just, basically. Yeah. Uh, like they think they're much taller than they are. And some guy friends of mine were like, just stand next to him because they knew I was tall. But it's just, you know, if you see a lot of my selfies and so on and so forth, I do take a lot of them seated. But I'm also um, just as an aside, uh, my I don't have like a, a short torso and like super long legs or anything that would be a tell for how tall mm -hmm. I am. Everything is I was built to be who I am is basically the best way to, to say it. So being that I've inhabited this body with various intersections since birth, <laughs> I've been a chubby kid, a chubby teenager, and a chubby adult. Um, for me, seeing bodies that look like mine were um, was something that was clutch. Uh, my mother was also a tall, fat, black woman. So she was the first queen that I saw, um, mm -hmm. to be quite honest. And uh, to see her navigate the world and all of her, all, you know, all of her ness, you know, her tallness, her, her fatness, her blackness, her beauty um, was the first example that I saw that uh, of beauty. And uh, growing up, Queen Latifah, uh, the John Waters films, those sorts of things, those things changed how I viewed myself at a pivotal age in my life. So when it came time for me to start documenting imagery, I started researching imagery. And this is the tirade that I will get on. There okay. is so much sameness in our industry, be it black photographers, white photographers, Asian photographers, so on and so forth. There's just so much sameness. And it's perpetuated by the fact that same perpetuates same. So the media in general that we look at is same. You know, you see the same figures, the same bodies. Kim Kardashian is lauded over for her body type, but she has kind of a enhanced black woman body type mm -hmm. um she's she's elevated whereas if you saw a black woman with a similar shape she may not be as elevated now now she may be but back then she probably wouldn't have been by back then i mean like a couple years ago <laughs> it seems but in, in either case it's still the sameness magazine covers movies tv shows it's all the same and usually when we see marginalized bodies be they black fat asian um tall it's in a certain light. So if you were to see, for example, a fat body on TV, most of the time they are struggling to live a la my 600 pound life, or they don't exist a la the sidekick on a TV show. If it's a fat black woman, the archetype is either a mamie stereotype or mammy stereotype, I should say, where we're shucking and jiving and taking care of the kids or a horn dog fat woman. If you think about most of the shows that you see with a fat black woman in it, she's always talking about all the men she wants. Um, the Parkers, I know people love it, but that is a prime example of that. Um, typically boorish, that sort of thing. So you don't, most of the imagery that you see plays onto the stereotypes. Stereotypes are, there is some truth to stereotypes, but they're not necessarily beneficial. Some are, some aren't. And that's just kind of something to keep in mind. So when it came to looking at photography and the industry that I was in, specifically, for the most part, I kind of came in predominantly white circles. I always saw slender, white, uh, conventionally attractive couples doing the same poses, um, wearing kind of the same outfits. And this was pre-Pinterest. But once Pinterest started, it you could you could spot... Oh my God, a it's bride a mile away. You could spot that photographer a mile away that shot that. And it got old. It got boring and it got old uh, for me. And when I look at the, the family and friends that I have, they're all so different. And I find them infinitely more fascinating <laughs> than the sameness that's 
presented to us through uh, media, through the industry uh, as a whole. Um, and even in Black photographer circles, there we do tend to fall into similar tropes. So for me, it kind of became a thing where I believe that everyone deserves to be seen. And I believe that everyone deserves a good portrait. And so being that I know how powerful imagery is, and how significant it was to my life, I wanted to make that available to someone else. So I tried to target marginalized bodies. I hate to use the phrase marginalized, but you understand what I mean. Um, I yeah, because it, it, I feel like marginalized makes it sound so downtrodden and that's not necessarily the case. But um, yeah, I try to focus. It goes back to it, the name of your, your, your business, Hidden Exposure. They're exactly. hidden. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're pushed away in a corner because we don't need to see that because that's mm -hmm. not what we want to elevate. <clears throat> yeah. And thankfully, you have um, certain groupings of people that really showcase. So I love some of the work of uh, Indian photographers and Asian photographers who they focus a lot on Indian and Asian folks because, you know, there's a there's a whole um, community and camaraderie there. And with Black photographers, too. Um, but I don't see very many fat photographers photographing fat folks. I don't see a lot of um, photographers photographing mixed size and mixed height couples. And I don't see a lot of photographers really working with people who have, um, you know, different abilities or so on and so forth. And I, I love seeing that in the forefront. And it became even more personal for me when I started dating my partner. My partner is a white uh, Canadian. And uh, as I said, I am tall. He is a couple of just shorter than me. Uh, he's also thin with a, uh, a more athletic build. I am softer. <laughs> and so when we went to get some photos done, we try to get photos done every couple of years because why not? We're a couple. Why not document it? Seems kind of silly for a photographer to not. Um, we were in Seattle and I was looking for a photographer to document us while we were out there. And I found myself writing basically a letter of apology to the photographer, seeing if they were available. By that, I mean, I said, hey, we're a long distance couple. Um, I were mixed height, mixed size and mixed race. Um, I know this may be something that you're not familiar with, is this something you would maybe be interested in, in, in working with us? And I sent it twice and said to myself, this is ridiculous. I shouldn't have to, in effect, apologize for who I'm in love with just to see if a photographer would be willing to photograph us. That's insane. That is yeah. not, that's insane that society has us in a place where you even as a photographer, as someone who's trying to highlight people like you or people who might be hidden like you, still felt the need to approach it that way. Yeah. That's yeah. And so th thankfully, I unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't work out that we could get someone in Seattle, but I got uh, responses back from two photographers that were just amazing. Their, their work was really diverse and I saw that in their portfolio. Um, we have a friend here who basically is the only person that we work with to do photos and she just loves hanging out with us. So that's the happy end to that. But that coupled with a conversation I had with a bunch of other photographers a few years ago, um, photography groups, if you are unaware, are sometimes the most beneficial and sometimes the most toxic places that you can be. And um, one of the photography groups that I was part of, um, we would do Zoom chats on a pretty consistent basis. And there were maybe about 15 of us in there. And one of the photographers brought up the fact that he was working with a couple and they weren't his ideal client. And so he would work on the session, but he wasn't going to show it in his portfolio or in any marketing that he did. Wow. And I asked him why, and he said he didn't want to get more couples like that. He wanted to get, he wanted to get the couples that were more that same that we saw. And he himself is more like the type of couple that I would work with, softer bodied, younger guy. Um, but that's not what he did. He said, nobody wants to see me in love. Nobody wants to see that. And in my head, I'm like, this is, this is ridiculous. That's you know, 
And after that, I was like, you know what? You're the type of photographer I would never want to hire because I know that you're not alone and that a lot of people only want to shoot a certain type because it'll get them more the type or the money's there. We all have money. It's all, it all spins the same. Mm -hmm. um, so why not photograph all the different types of couples and all the different types of love that you can? And, you know, I've seen in groups as well, uh, photographers stymied by how to pose couples that aren't the same. You know, I can't tell you how many posts that I saw, this is a few years back, where they were like, okay, I'm shooting this couple and she's plus size and 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 he's not like, how do I pose them? And I was like, you pose them like you would pose any other couple. Um, spoiler alert, your couple knows who they are. So your couple knows if they are fat, if they're tall, if they're mixed height, mixed size, they know. It's not like they woke up one morning and went, oh, I know. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and you were fat and you were skinny. Yeah. Huh? You know, it's not like I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm black. You know, um, I wake up in the morning with a full knowledge of the fact that I am. And that's OK. And so my response to them all the time was just capture them in love. That's what they want. Or just capture their beauty. That's what they want. Um, I also do boudoir, and I'm actually, it's the first time I'm saying it publicly, I'm moving towards uh, specifically targeting um, marginalized bodies, in particular fat women. Um, mm -hmm. Because when it comes to boudoir, one of the common things that I've seen uh, in some of the fat spaces that I occupy is a lot of the girls are very nervous about getting their photo taken because a lot of boudoir photographers don't show large bodies. They don't know how to pose large bodies. I'm seeing a, a trend, a change in that, but I feel like boudoir is such an empowering experience for anybody who does it. Why not show all different types of bodies? You know, yeah. why not do it um, from my perspective, from a more uh, empowering gaze? It's not to say that. Uh, the more traditional and more sexually explicit photos aren't empowering. But for me, I try to capture uh, my client in their um, natural habitat. Um, if they want to strip down to their skivvies, it's fine with me. Uh, but I want them to look at these and be able to say, this is me where I am right now. Let's celebrate that body that I'm in right now. So I take a lot of cues from Cheyenne Gill, who is amazing. Um, and she too does a lot of work. She only does boudoir for the most part. And um, she pushes marginalized bodies to the front. So all of her marketing and whatnot are of fat bodies, black bodies, Hispanic bodies. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, so that all of that kind of pushed me in that direction. And this feels like the next phase for me is to take something I'm passionate about, which is the boudoir side of things. Um, I love all of my clients. If they ever see this, I love you all. <laughs> I just find when I come back from boudoir sessions, I'm even more amped and more excited about being able to take this message of um, body positivity, of empowerment, of uh, strength and beauty and put it to practice in a session. So that's kind of the ebb and flow of why, my why, my how, my frustrations with the industry and where I'm at now. So I want to re rewind um, to something you mentioned. Um, sure. Next to the boudoir piece and the posing mixed couples piece. And that's the issue of posing. Because yeah. some, when I first started taking pictures and they were talking about poses, and I actually had um, a coworker who asked me to take their engagement pictures. This was very mm -hmm. early on. And uh, I felt pray to the Pinterest trap and I own that. But then yeah. they were all just like, oh, here's how you pose um, mixed size couples. And what I noticed, <clears throat> excuse me, what I noticed in a lot of the posing suggestions is the poses were always designed to quote unquote hide the larger yes. individual. Tell me more about when you look at posing of mixed size couples, of larger individuals in boudoir, where does your mind go? 
So uh, I always tell my clients from the gym, I don't do Photoshop. Uh, I may do some slight adjustments, like if they have blemishes on their faces, I'll take those off or um, little things like that. But for the, you know, your body is your body. And I want to do things to... You and me are, you and me are here. I'm the same yeah. way. I'm like, your face is your face. And if I want to photograph it, it's because I find it fascinating. But yeah. you want to make you look like you... Like you magazine cover ready I'm not the one <laughs> yeah I and to be fair and to be honest I have no problem with retouching it's just not what I do um I have some friends that do some amazing retouching work and I love it and they make the skin look great but that's a tangent but what I tell my clients is that these sessions are to capture you as you are you are wonderful and I want to capture that wonderfulness so is the language that I use when I pose, it's not to hide anything. There are some classic poses that you do, specifically when it comes to boudoir, where you know you want to show curves or you want to show the bend of someone's body. And so my language changed from, you know, let's let's if you want to hide your your backside, this is what you do, into more of a let's accentuate this. So I'm gonna have you take a step back and move your hip this way. And that gives me what I look, what, you know, what we're looking for. You're still going to look like you and that is fine. And, um, camping on that boudoir piece because boudoir in general is so transformative. Um, a lot of what I've started doing with my clients here recently is assuring them that when you see these photos, you may not want to look at them for two weeks or a month or a year. And that's fine because it's a shock. Because oftentimes when we take selfies and when we take photos, we're in control of the narrative of what the photo looks like. I can, you know, move the camera a certain way. And then there's that angle that's up here that, you know, slims me down, that sort of thing. Um, but that this is who you are, you know, and, and a lot of times, you know, I've heard it, it took me a little bit. And now these are some of my favorite photos. But a lot of when it comes to boudoir, it's the language that I use. Um, I try not to use language that um, demeans any sort of body type, regardless of if they're fat, thin, or what have you. Uh, the actual physical posing, I try to use the same posing that I would for any of my clients, making adjustments where necessary. So I'll camp on that for a second. Adjustments where necessary, what I mean by that is finding out if their body has any limitations or if that day their body has any limitations. Um, I don't mean limitations in a negative way, but sometimes people have knees that may not work properly, or they may have a thing with their back, or um, it may be something that, you know, they can't hang upside down for some reason. So we adjust the session to however their body is feeling in that moment, um, to not push anything to make them uncomfortable. Because if you're uncomfortable physically while you're in your session, it's just going to be a hard time for all parties involved. Um, I, uh, I did my own boudoir session last year, beginning of last year. And one of the things that I loved that the photographer put on there was asking what things do you embrace about your body and what things are you learning to embrace about your body? Notice that's a little different than saying what things what do, you do you hate, what things do you like? Yeah. So even coming into that, that helps. Um, as far as couples are concerned, so I said I was a storyteller photographer. And what that looks like for me is I try to find out the story of my couple. I try to find out their PDA awareness as well, because a lot of couples aren't all about being all over top of each other all the time. <laughs> so I try to find out as much about the couple coming in as I can. And I will put them in a situation I may have them sitting on a steps or whatever and I'll just say hey why don't you guys talk to each other and I may give them a prompt like um, why don't you tell me something that you love about the other person and just let that unfold and it's not about hiding anything it's not about obscuring anything it's just capturing that moment and nine times out of ten I get a lot of laughs probably has something to do with me being goofy behind the lens. Uh, <laughs> I get a lot of just genuine moments. Um, and if they want to make out, they can make out. We will photograph the making out. That's fine. But I let, I guess all that to say, I let, in most of my sessions, I let my couples sort of guide 
where we go. Um, trying to be as informed about who they are as I can. In my boudoir sessions, I let the client guide where they want to go. Um, there's a lot to be said for uh, asking them, especially in boudoir, and I'm just going to share this for folks who may do boudoir photography, to get to know their client, not all of their intimate details, but I have had a couple of instances where I've had clients who have had an abuse past and doing boudoir is a huge letting go of a lot of things and unpacking a lot of things. And so I try to be a little informed about that, try to make sure that I ask permission before I make any adjustments to their body so as not to have them clench up in boudoir if you shoot boudoir. And I guess this trickles out into everything. You want to make sure that your clients are the most comfortable that they can be. Um, so there's a respect that needs to be there because they're trusting you with an intimate part of their life, be it a couple, be it a family, be a boudoir, you're walking into whatever life they're living. And so, you know, somebody may say, well, you're being too sensitive. I would rather be too sensitive and aware than try to violate their, violate may not be the proper word, but to try to push my way in and do it the way that I want to do it. And not, you know, some people want me to be heavy handed with the posing and then, you know, we'll do that when I do some editorial work, that can be the case. But when it comes to something intimate like couples and people are, I try to get a bit of their backstory. I try to ask permission if need be. Um, I try to be aware of any uh, issues they may be having with their body at that particular point in time. Turn around. Oh, sorry if you're here. Don't make them go no faster. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, Amy, thank you. Um, <laughs> but I try to make them as much a part of the creative possible uh, process as possible. And when I pose, um, I use language that is neutral and or affirming where it, where it needs to happen. Um, we don't hide anything. We're just trying to find ways to accentuate. We don't want to slim you down. We just want to show off a curve. So even that sort of language, it helps to empower them uh, in those spaces. And it's a beautiful thing to watch the couples blossom and the uh, boudoir client blossom throughout the session, um, especially once they can kind of relax themselves into it. So uh, that is kind of how I work on posing. It's more uh, the physical posing. Yes, there are certain things um, that you do, but I find that the language uh, approached with it changes things. Um, because yes, standing on your back foot, it does make, you know, and you make that little turn this way, it does kind of make for a curve. It does make the booty pop a little bit better. You know, there are certain things that will do that, but I don't try to use the, oh, I'm going to slim you down, you know, if you've got uh, arms or whatever. We're going to hide parts of your body because I don't want to do that. I just want you to, you know, be sexy in the moment, whatever that looks like for you. Last question. Sure. What are you, what are you shooting? Because you mentioned that you were, you got at one point a Canon Rebel. Are you still shooting Canon? Are you like Fujifilm? What are you doing? No, I, I am I am a dedicated Canon girl. Um, I have a 6D, the classic 6D. Um, I got that a couple years ago. So it's my first full frame and mama is very happy with her first full frame. <laughs> so I love I it. I get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think I will always shoot Canon uh, just because that's what I learned on. Uh, but, you know, I know some people are loving these mirrorless cameras, the Sonys and stuff like that. And there may come a point in time where I transition into mirrorless because it isn't as heavy, it is lighter, so on and so forth, yeah, can schmackety. But for now, it's the Canon. It's it's the Canon, it's in my little bag of tricks. <laughs> Jamie, thank you so much for talking to me on this Sunday morning. No problem, thank you for having me. Oh, and I did wanna uh, say one other thing. Um, that I'm doing and working with at this particular point in time, um, if anyone is interested. So uh, back in 2000, well, uh, Mother's Day of 2019, I launched a series called the Aya Sessions, 
uh, IYA, uh, Aya is Yoruba for mother, and uh, they're mother and me sessions, but with a twist. And the twist is that I wanted to highlight and focus on black mothers and their adult daughters. So black mothers and caregivers and their adult daughters. Because I find that we don't oftentimes talk about uh, the strength and bond of that relationship. And many of us had very wonderful relationships or have very wonderful relationships as adults with our mothers or mother figures. And I thought, why not highlight that? So um, that is a series that I'm working on. Um, and it's been so awesome. Uh, I, it's kind of like a Humans of New York sort of thing where I sit with them, take some photos with them, and I ask two questions. Uh, one to the mother or mother figure, which is what advice would you give to a black woman on how to navigate the world and for the, the daughter um, it's what words of thanks would you give to your mother for teaching you how to navigate the world as a black woman and um, if anyone is interested in being a part this is something that is now like a lifelong thing for me I don't foresee me stopping doing it at any point in time <laughs> in the near future um, so if anybody is interested um, I know that all of my contact information will be there and I'll put a little, you know, give you that information as well. So now, I just want you to have, share that. Are you traveling for those sessions as well? Because I know some people who might be interested, but they're not in Virginia. Yes, yes, I am traveling for those sessions. Um, I've got a couple folks uh, in uh, Toronto that I'll be working with, second home. Um, I did some in North Carolina uh, over the summer. So yeah. You know, and if we want to make it like a big thing, we can make it a big thing if you know a couple people. But yeah, that is um, that is kind of what I'm doing. Like that's my passion project to keep me focused on that and all of the other stuff that I'm doing. So this is my little passion project. Awesome. Jamie, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.